Uh, and I would like to introduce you our next speaker, Mark Berry from Stanford University. Dr. Berry practices all aspects of thoracic surgery. He has a particular interest in minimally invasive techniques. And he serves as the co-director of the Stanford Minimally Invasive Thoracic Surgery Center. And today, Dr. Berry will uh, present uh, the topic using SEER Medicare to identify disparities in cancer care. So please, Mark, you can share your screen now. Okay. And start your presentation. Okay. Give me uh, one second. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. My, my presentation? Yes, we can see you. Your presentation, I mean. Yeah, thank great. you. So thanks very much for the opportunity to participate. Um, and I also appreciate being able to follow Dr. Yashkin because he's going over a lot of the Medicare uh, uh, research issues that I'll, I'll, I'll go over in a lot less detail. But what I'm going to talk about is using the SEER Medicare data set to identify disparities in cancer care. And just gonna give a brief outline. I'm gonna discuss disparities in cancer care in general, and also uh, disparities in terms of lung cancer in specific, because that's the area that I focus on. I'm gonna just briefly talk about some of the study sets that are available where you could try to study cancer disparities, but then just focus on using SEER Medicare data set for this topic. I'll go over some of the benefits and limitations of using that data set for disparity research and then some of the nuts and bolts, um, but not nearly as much detail as what Dr. Yashkin just went into. Uh, talk about one study that, that I've done in the past, and then just a very brief summary. So just in general, cancer disparities are known to exist across multiple patient groups and multiple cancers. Many of these disparities exist between patient uh, races. And for example, Black women are much more likely to die of breast cancer than, than other races, and black men are much more likely to die of pr prostate cancer than other races. But the disparities go beyond just this, the simple race uh, definition. Hispanics and Latinos have higher rates of cervical cancer than women of other races and ethnic groups other than blacks. American Indians and Alaska Natives have higher death rates from kidney cancer than other races. American Indians and, and Alaska Natives have higher rates of liver and intrahepatic bile duct cancer which is also seen in Asian and Pacific Islander uh, races. And then these disparities also go beyond just race and ethnicity. Uh, and it's seen that incidence rates of colorectal, lung, and cervical cancers are much higher in rural Appalachian areas rather than urban areas in this region. Now, there are multiple factors that come into play and cause disparities. And some of the underlying reasons are related to just differential cancer biology and genetics in the different patient groups. These are not necessarily modifiable in themselves, but knowing and understanding them can improve outcomes by impacting the way different patients are either screened or, or treated or followed over time. Another element that comes into play in disparities is a lack of diversity in clinical trials in where trial results may not be generalizable across races that are not well representative in the trials. And there is a lot of work or a lot of focus in the clinical trial world to try to improve this. But probably the areas where there are the most room for improvement outcomes may be in better understanding and ultimately modifying different social determinants of health. And this can involve both environment and behavior. And for example, Patients that live in areas where they have limited access to healthy food or limited access to things, say, such as healthy water, can have different impacts of different diagnoses on their health. This can also impact their behavior, where there may be a higher rate of patients having obesity or higher uses of things like alcohol and uh, tobacco that can impact a patient's health overall, as well as their ability to tolerate different health treatments. And then different uh, areas can also limit a patient's natural or, or their ability to do functional activities and can also lead to higher rates of obesity. 
Another component of social determinant of health is obstacles in getting health care. And this can be related to low income or low health literacy among patients, can be involved in where the patients live and also their insurance status. And, and these, are, these can all be uh, interrelated. For example, even patients that have good insurance may have a, a lower ability to actually use their health care. For example, if they can't get days off from their jobs to be able to go and see doctors or get treatments. And then also built into our society, is, unfortunately, it's just institutional racism, which obviously will cause chronic stress to different patients. It can impact patients' care by both observed and inherent uh, or unknown private uh, provider bias, and then overall system mistrust among different races. And just to go into a little bit of disparities in lung cancer, which as I mentioned, is something that I focus mostly on, you know, compared to white patients, black patients have a higher incidence of lung cancer. They're less likely to get therapy. And in particular, patients who have early stage and potentially resectable lung cancer that could be treated with surgery, they get that surgery less often and they tend to have worse survival. And biology may explain some of the racial differences that are observed because it has been seen that black cigarette smokers are more susceptible to lung cancer than white cigarette smokers. But most likely the disparities can be explained by differences in the way that races are, are present with cancer, how they're diagnosed and how they're ultimately treated. And there's definitely shifts in the stage distribution in terms of the time of diagnosis for patients across different races. Just to give a little bit of a background on the scope of, of, of lung cancer, uh, if in the year 2021, there's gonna be over 600,000 cancer-related deaths and lung cancer accounts for almost a quarter of those. And you can see on this graph, which is from the American Cancer Society, lung cancer represents the majority of patient deaths, can, uh, cancer-related deaths, both in men and in women. And it's over 20% in both uh, sexes. And even though more other cancers are more common, for example, breast cancer in females and prostate cancer in males, lung cancer accounts for more deaths than, than even those two uh, cancer diagnoses combined. And the big problem with lung cancer is that the survival rate for lung cancer in general is very dismal compared to other cancers, where you can see the five-year survival rate for prostate cancer can be as high as 98%, and for breast cancer can be 90%. For, for lung cancer, it's only 20%. So it, it's a sobering disease, but there are, I hope, a lot of opportunities for improving patient care and patient outcomes. Now, just like I mentioned with cancer in general, the disparities in lung cancer go beyond just between blacks and whites. And other clinical and non-clinical factors contribute importantly to both the incidence of lung cancer as well as the outcomes that are observed with lung cancer. And most of these other factors are related to social and economic status and educational status. And lung cancer incidence increases with both decreasing socioeconomic status as well as lower educational statuses. And survival also varies with these factors. And, and it may be that those are the things that ultimately are most important beyond just the, the specific race of a patient. And just like cancer in general, geography plays a part in the observed racial differences for lung cancer. And lung cancer incidence in the United States varies and is highest in the South, which is a distribution that does par uh, parallel the prevalence of smoking throughout the United States. It, interestingly, there does not appear to be a disparate response in terms of treatment. So once patients get the appropriate treatment for cancer and you control for their comorbidities and their functional status and other potential confounding factors, people of different race in general respond to the therapy the same. The problem is, is that the patients are not as likely to present with the same stage of disease, and they're also not as likely to get the same treatment, 
which does vary with their race and across their other socioeconomic factors. So addressing disparities in cancer is obviously not simple or straightforward, just as it isn't in other diseases. Ultimately, it's gonna require policy changes to overcome all these different systemic social, racial, and institutional inequalities. And that's gonna to need to address health interventions, access to care and clinical trials, and also examining genetic factors in, in more depth and hopefully identify the issues that, that explain the differences that we see for patients. But clearly, better data is needed to better understand the disparities and guide these policy changes. And explaining why some groups of patients are more or less likely to develop and die from cancer or experience cancer-related health problems. And so far, a lot of disparity uh, studies in cancer have been very good at documenting the problem, but really the field needs to move beyond that and towards a better understanding of identifying the specific causes for disparities and then developing and testing interventions to remedy those disparities. And these are eventually gonna probably have to uh, uh, address access to care, patients' ability to navigate through the healthcare system, and then interventions at the community level, like improving cancer screening and smoking cessation programs in specific populations where that is lacking or where that's particularly needed. One exciting uh, area in disparities though is that there are a lot of opportunities for collaborations across different disciplines. Dr. Yashkin just gave a great talk on how to use Medicare data to investigate uh, aging related diseases. And there are, you're considering the complexity of of invest using Medicare data for research, there's a lot of opportunities for people with expertise in clinical disciplines to collaborate with people who have expertise in, in staging and, and or, uh, modeling and statistical analysis. So there are a lot of different study sets that are available for cancer-related studies. You can use a single center population database, or you can, uh, uh, combine a couple centers to create bigger population of patients. These have the advantage of having, in general, more complete data, including clinical details such as functional status and other things that might not be available in an administrative data sets or larger registries. The problem with these studies in general is that they tend to be retrospective and they're relatively small, and they're also not necessarily generalizable beyond those typically specialized centers. Clinical trial data in general is very thorough and has very good follow-up, but this data is not always available to researchers outside the trial participants. And these trial results also may not be generalizable across outside that study cohort. The, the SEER uh, cancer registry is a, a very good uh, data set for investigating cancer. Uh, it's a very large data set with a diverse group of both patients and cancers. It does have a limited amount of non-cancer clinical data. And until recently, there was very limited information even about chemotherapy use, which is obviously something that can be very important in cancer-related studies. There are some other limitations in terms of the details available for both cancer staging and cancer therapy. And there's usually almost no data for the patients other than just the peri treatment period. Uh, the National Cancer Database is another data set that's similar to SEER, that, but that is uh, administered by the American College of Surgeons. This is not as large or as inclusive of SEER, but does have some improvements in uh, the data that's available for investigation. It is limited though to patients that are uh, involved with the American uh, College of Surgeons, and so it's not available to all researchers. Now, SEER Medicare is a linkage of the SEER program of cancer registries with Medicare claims for patients that were Medicare eligible in the SEER data set. And then this data is also supplemented with U.S. census data 
So you can get some information about the, the census tract where patients live, which is where you can get information about that patient's social and economic status. It's a collaborative effort of the National Cancer Institute, the SEER registries, and then the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services or, or CMS. The linkage was first completed between the SEER registry and Medicare claims in 1991. And it's been subsequently updated about every two years. And they, uh, they uh, estimate that they uh, capture about 95% of the patients that are 65 or older in the SEER files and are able to match them to Medicare enrollment files. It is a very large and complex data set, just as the Medicare data set in general is. It comprises both the SEER data file, which is where you get a lot of information about a patient's uh, cancer status, which can include their stage as well as treatment, in addition to some other demographic data. And then you get the Medicare information that goes along with the patients that were linked to the, uh, the patients in the SEER registry. And, and Dr. Yashkin just went over all the different data that's available in the Medicare files. And in general, this is the data that is available in the SEER Medicare data set. When you get SEER Medicare data, you get two cohorts of patients. You get the patients who have the cancer diagnosis, and then there's a random sample of Medicare beneficiaries from a 5% sample of uh, Medicare beneficiaries in the SEER areas who don't have cancer. And these non-cancer patients can be used for comparative purposes, such as looking at the cost of care or the use of specific tests or procedures among this random sample of Medicare beneficiaries and compared to them to the patients who have cancer. There's a lot of reasons to use your Medicare data if you're doing cancer-related studies. For one, it allows assembling a pretty big cohort of patients at the population level. And this can be especially advantageous if you're either exploring an uncommon disease where there might not be any, a large number of patients at any specific center, or if you're looking at an uncommon or specific substage of cancer where one single center might not really be able to accumulate a lot of patients. So you may not be able to look at that type of specific situation in much detail. It also allows investigation into specific situations where realistically you'll never be able to look at that uh, area in a clinical trial. And that's related to the expense and complexity of enrolling patients in clinical trial. It can be related to uncommon disease stages or uncommon diseases where it's difficult even across multi-centers to get a lot of patients. It can be difficult to randomize some treatments. For example, major surgery is something that many patients are not willing to leave to chance on whether or not they're gonna get it for their cancer. And in many cases, it's unlikely a prospective study would ever accumulate anywhere near the number of patients that a, a SEER Medicare study could, could generate. Probably the biggest advantage of SEER Medicare compared to these other data sets that I mentioned is that you can examine patients across a longitudinal time frame that includes their pre-cancer and their post-cancer periods. You can look at the impact of specific comorbid conditions, both before they develop cancer as well as after they develop cancer, using the techniques that Dr. Yashkin mentioned. And then you can also investigate the use of non-therapeutic interventions, both diagnostic studies and, and other things, as well as healthcare utilization in general in those patients. SEER Medicare does have limitations. It's a retrospective study, and clearly there's selection bias in terms of treatment that you need to try to account for when you're doing your analyses. It relies on an administrative database, and so you can have missing data. It only includes patients that are older, age 65 or older, uh, except for the patients, as mentioned, who are either are disabled or have end-stage renal disease. So you may not be able to generalize your results to younger patients. You also may not be able to do really good studies if it's a cancer that tends to occur in younger patients. And, and even though you can assemble a good comorbidity index with this Medicare data, 
you really don't have good information on the acuity or the severity of those diseases. So you have some limitations in looking at the impact of comorbid conditions on cancer treatment and cancer outcomes in general. And then there are some seer specific issues in terms of the way cancer staging has changed over time and the way that some cancer specific variables have changed in the way they're recorded in SEER over time. And you need to look at those variables pretty carefully when you're doing studies to make sure that you account for the changes over time. You get the data from the SEER Medicare, uh, from, from CMS. It's uh, not public use data files, so you have to apply for the, the data, and that's because there is some remote risk of re-identifying patients or re-identifying re providers. You have to apply for the data with a specific research question. And they do not look at the quality of your study, but they just make sure that your study is going to maintain patient privacy and that your study can be done with the data that is available in CR Medicare. Once you go through the process and you get approved to get this year Medicare data, you ultimately get a, a, a compressed data file, the compressed and uh, encrypted data file that you can then put into your own machines and then start your, your analysis. Getting the data involves applying for it and signing a data use agreement. You need to have institutional review board approval from your institution. If you are uh, doing a study that's somehow supported or involving a consulting firm, a contractor, or a pharmaceutical company, you have to provide a letter that you're going to be free to do your work uh, without their influence, and you can publish your findings without any limitations. There are two reviews that are done once you submit your application, and then once the project is approved, you have to pay for the data, and then you'll get that data within a couple of weeks. The criteria for approving a request uh, uh, involves making sure you're not going to compromise privacy of the patients or the providers in the data set. Your central purpose of your study has to be cancer research. Your research question needs to be able to be answered by the your Medicare data. And then you need to uh, make sure that you're not asking for data that is so complex for them to compile that it would be what they consider uh, inappropriate. It does cost money to get the data. Uh, for example, if you want to get all lung cancer patients, it'll cost almost $17,000. If you want to get lung cancer and breast cancer patients, it's almost $25,000. If you want to get lung, breast, and colorectal cancer, it's $31,500. And then you can get other cancer sites as well, and it will cost more money as you add those cancer sites. If you anticipate using the data to investigate different cancers, it's good to plan ahead because you can save money by buying them all once rather than buying each cancer site at a separate time. Uh, if you go to the SEER Medicare website, they do have uh, a web page where you can get an estimate on how much it will cost to get your data, depending on what cancer you want and what data files you want. Uh, just going to uh, go to using the data in a little more detail. Now, Dr. Yashkin went into a lot more detail on how to use Medicare data. Um, but in general, you use the same techniques that he mentioned. You get the data, the, the Medicare files, which can be the, the MedCAR files, which basically are facility files, whether they're uh, inpatient or other types of facilities. You get the claims files, which can be both inpatient claims and outpatient claims from providers. There's an outpatient claims file, as well as a durable medical equipment file. And then just like Dr. Yashkin said, you use different procedure codes and diagnosis codes and other terminology codes to identify specific interventions or studies. 
Uh, and here I just show two tables which show how you can identify people who are treated with either chemotherapy or radiation therapy based on Medicare claims. And there's a lot of different codes that in, can indicate those treatments. And you can find them in different uh, formats throughout the Medicare files. So you have to be uh, pretty inclusive in terms of how you're gonna capture a, a therapy or a diagnostic study um, before you do your study and then you can use these codes to classify people according to diagnosis or therapy or, or other treatments. You can use the SEER Medicare uh, data set to identify specific surgeries and for different cancers. And that can also be uh, using these procedure codes that uh, were, were described. And you can do the same thing to uh, identify specific diagnostic procedures. And these can be things like CAT scans or PET scans, and they can be even invasive uh, diagnostic procedures like bronchoscopy or endoscopy or other specific types of those procedures. There's been over 2,000 publications of studies using SEER Medicare data since 1993. And these are some just uh, recent ones looking at the use of SEER Medicare in disparities. And you can see these three recent studies looked at cancers such as multiple myeloma, lung cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Just very briefly, a few years ago, we published a study looking at the uh, specific substage of stage 3A non-small cell lung cancer patients in elderly patients. Uh, the reason we investigated this study with your Medicare is that basically the guidelines for cancer care say you can use any combination of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy for these specific patients. So we're interested in looking at how these patients were treated in the elderly uh, population. And I won't go into detail, but there's a lot of controversies in regards to how to best treat these patients, and we are trying to identify how these controversies might actually be coming into play when uh, at the, the patient treatment level. And for this relatively uncommon substage, we're able to accumulate a cohort of almost 3,000 patients, and we're able to look at the patterns of care, but also the different predictors of care. And what we found was that the most important predictor was a patient's age, uh, but other things that came into play were the local extent of their cancer, their, their gender, and then other socioeconomic status related variables. So just a, a quick summary, disparities definitely exist in cancer in terms of diagnosis, treatments, and outcomes. Research to date has mostly focused on documenting and defining the problem but research in the future really needs to look at specific factors that can be modified so we eliminate these disparities. There are a lot of different data sets that are available that can be used to identify or, or investigate disparities, uh, but SEER Medicare is one very good, large and diverse data set that has many benefits. It can be complex to use SEER Medicare, but having some upfront investment in learning how to use the data set can ultimately facilitate doing a lot of different studies. Uh, and I think from my own experience, and I'm sure what many other people would experience, is that the first study is usually the hardest in terms of coming up with all the codes that you need to use, as well as learning how to understand the files. And once you do that first study, it's much easier to do future studies. And again, there's a lot of opportunities for really good, strong collaborations between both clinical and non-clinical researchers in doing disparity research using SEER Medicare. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Sure. Uh, we have just one question. Uh, we have time for one question uh, from the audience. How are patients linked across data sets? Yeah, they are linked using um, the, the, SEER, the SEER registry, I believe, has a patient's social security number, as well as some other patient-specific information. 
And they use that as well as the patient's date of birth and then their basic demographics to, to link the, 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 you know, the, date, the, the person who's identified in SEER to the, the Medicare participant. And then once they do that, the, uh, the, the SEER Medicare uh, group provides a unique patient identifier that is then applied across the SEER data sets as well as all the Medicare files. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for your excellent presentation.